Today we'll be talking about this paper, and it basically looks at the structure activity relationship between a battery of psychedelic drugs and how changing their structure changes their signaling output. As usual, let's talk a little bit about some background information. Uh, so serotonin 2A has signaling pathways, much like any G-protein coupled receptor. And here is a picture of the serotonin 2A receptor with LSD bound inside the middle of the receptor. So basically all G-protein coupled receptors, including the serotonin 2A receptor, have secondary messenger pathway signaling that are activated. One of these is the G-protein pathway, which phosphorylates the protein. And another one is the beta arrestin 2 pathway, which is responsible for recycling the receptor. And we can think about these as sort of a seesaw effect, where one pathway can be activated more than another pathway, and this is based on the structure of the drug. And in this paper, this is really what we're looking at, is the difference between the structure of the drug and the difference in how much it activates G protein versus the beta arrestin 2 pathway. The first class of compounds this paper looks at are the tryptamines, which has this common scaffold. The first tryptamine they look at is dimethyltryptamine, so DMT, because it has two methyl groups coming off of the nitrogen. The next tryptamine they look at is dipropyltryptamine, or DPT, and propyl because it has two propyl groups coming off of the nitrogen. And lastly, they look at DIPT or diisopropyl tryptamine because there is an isopropyl group coming off of the nitrogen. In this paper, they use LSD as a reference compound. They first measure LSD's effect at beta arrestin and G protein, which is denoted G alpha Q. And you see listed here the EC50 values listed uh, for beta arrestin at 5.95 and for mini GAQ or G protein at 5.70. They use the compound as a reference because these values are basically the same, showing that LSD doesn't necessarily have a preferred pathway. Each pathway is activated um, very similarly. So they denote the E max in both cases as 100%, so we can compare that to other compounds in the paper. The first set of experiments we actually see in the paper are these ones that look at the tryptamines. I have left the LSD compound in there as reference. We notice that as we go from DMT to DPT to DIPT in the beta arrestin pathway, in terms of potency or EC50, going from 114 to 181 to 759, that is an increase in numbers. Increase in value denotes a decrease in potency of the compound as we change the uh, carbons on that chain. Emax, however, going from 74 to 95 to 102 is an increase. So basically, although we decrease the potency of the drug, we increase the efficacy or basically how high that receptor gets turned on. We also see this measurement in mini GAQ, which is really just the G protein signaling. Uh, we notice the same thing, the values increasing from 328 to 1051 to 26059. So once again, we are decreasing the potency. And similarly, we are also increasing the Emax, which shows that we're increasing the maximal effect by the receptor by elongating that, that chain. And then we see this B factor. B factor of zero indicates there's no preferential preference pathway, which is what LSD does. A positive beta factor would denote that we are seeing a preferential preference for the beta arrestin pathway, while a negative value denotes a preference for the G protein pathway. All of these values being positive denote a preference for the um, beta arrestin pathway. So in summary, what we can say is that as we elongate the chain, okay, we decrease the potency but increase the efficacy but this does not have a significant effect on signaling bias. The bias is relatively the same, being all, in this case, um, beta arrestin bias.
The next class of compounds cited in the paper is the phenylalkylenes, which have this base structure and are basically just going to be structural analogs related to mescaline. We have the compound 2CB fly, which is famously named this way because it looks like a dragonfly, 2CB fly. Then we have bromo dragonfly, which just has an extra methyl group coming off of the carbon, one away from the amine. And then we have our bromo dragonfly, which is one of the enantimerically pure versions of bromo dragonfly, being the R enantiomer pointing into the plane of the page in this methyl group. Then we have 2CH, 2CI, which is where if we took 2CH and added an iodine, one group, one carbon away from the methoxy group, we would get this. Uh, then we have DOI, which also has the iodine, but notice how it has an extra methyl group, one carbon away from the amine. Then we have DOH, which is basically the same compound as DOI, except if we were to take away the iodine group. And then lastly, we have NME2CH, which basically just imagine taking DOH's methyl group, ripping it off, and putting that methyl group on the amine. The results of the phenylalkylamine compounds is as follows. We, of course, place our LSD as our reference compound for your comparison. Then we had the 2CB fly, R bromo dragonfly, and bromo dragonfly. Let's compare those first. If we start with 2CB fly at the beta arrested pathway, the EC50 is 8.07 compared to R bromo dragonfly and bromo dragonfly. These have EC50 values of 1.33 and 1.53, indicating that that substitution increases the potency by about sixfold, which is pretty substantial, much more potent compounds. Notice how the E max, if we compare 2CB fly and our bromo dragonfly and bromo dragonfly at the beta arrestant pathway goes from about 80 to 125. So we are increasing both the potency and the efficacy of the drug in that substitution. Basically, the same applies for the uh, G protein pathway, where the potency is increased by about fivefold. And notice how the E max also increases in the uh, G protein pathway. If we consider the structures to figure out a structural indication as to what's going on, it's really this. It's really that as we add, we see the addition of a methyl group, one carbon away from the amine, we increase potency. That's shown to be true. But this does not seem to have a drastic effect on signaling bias, and we can figure that out by looking at the beta factor value, which is for 2CB5 is 0 0.180, 0 0.152 for our bromo dragonfly, and 0 0.0333 for bromo dragonfly. So they're basically very close to zero bias, which would indicate they don't have much of a preference for one pathway over another, but they are positive, so they have a slight preference for the beta arrestant pathway. Let's continue on looking at the phenylalkylamines. For this one, I have placed the reference compound as mescaline because these compounds are much similar structurally to mescaline. Uh, 2CH has the following uh, parameters. If we change 2CH and add basically that iodine position, we see something wild, and it's that the potency increases. Look at the EC50 of 2CH versus 2CI and DOI going from 1,220 to 4.9 and 3.39. That's about an increase in potency of 250. That's uh, wild. Um, we don't see much of an increase in the Emax at the beta arrestant level. In terms of the um, G protein signaling, if you look at the EC50 of mini G alpha Q, uh, we see the potency going from almost 2000 to 11 and 10. That's about a 200 times increase in potency. Pretty wild just by adding the iodine. And we see a bit of a change in Emax and going from 2CI to DOI, but nothing super significant like the potency. Uh, these two compounds are if we rip away the uh, iodine and change the position of the methyl group. And we see that the, the we see a great loss in potency in doing so, which suggests that the iodine has a 
large factor in the incredible potency of these drugs. So what we can really conclude from these structural drugs is that the addition of an iodine increases the potency by about 250 times, and addition of a methyl group one carbon away from the amine slightly increases the potency just by a little bit, but neither has a significant effect on signaling bias. And the last few structural analogs of psychedelics studied in this publication are NBOM derivatives, which have the following core structure. The first of which is 25-HNBF, which has a fluorine uh, coming off of this phenyl ring. 25-HNBOH, uh, which has an alcohol substitute on the phenyl ring instead of a fluorine. 25-HNBOM and BOME, which has a methoxy group coming off of the ring. And 25-HNBMT, which has this dioxane ring coming off. The compounds below 25INBF, these are going to be the same compounds as their corresponding one at the top, except they have iodines um, at the position uh, one carbon away from the methoxy group, which we saw was a, a drastic increase in potency. The iodine really made these compounds super potent. So we have 25INBF, 25INBOH. 25-INBOME, and 25-INBMD. And now let's look at the results of the NBOM derivatives. We have LSD as our reference compound, and the NBOM derivatives, four of the following. So what we see in that going from 25-HNBF to 25-HNBMD in the beta arresting potency or EC50 assay is that we increase potency by a pretty big deal, 190 to 68. Uh, then from 25-HNBMD to 25-HNBOH, where we replace that with an alcohol group, we increase the potency by about 10 times. It's pretty good. And then slightly the 25-HNBOME uh, is where we have a methoxy group, and that increases the potency by a little bit. But note that the alcohol and the methoxy substitution are very potent here. Um, the efficacy does increase, but not at, by as big of a factor as the potency, uh, going from 107 to 124 to 143 to 153. And we basically see the same thing with the um, G protein pathway, basically the same results there. We should note that these compounds, the beta value being much greater than zero, these are significantly beta arrested bias, which I find interesting. So structurally, what we can say that is going from a fluorine to a dioxane to an alcohol to a methoxy increases the potency greater than the uh, efficacy and that these compounds are uh, significantly beta arrested bias over being uh, G-protein bias. And lastly, we have the last set of the NBOM derivative compounds continued. So we have LSD as our reference, then we have all of the, this time the iodinated uh, NBOM complex with the iodine. And if we remember a few slides ago, we saw that iodine drastically made these compounds much more potent. And if you compare the potencies of the previous slide to this slide, you see that these are way more potent with the iodine uh, attached to them. And they follow the same kinds of similar results as the last ones. And the kind of punchline results of this were that going from a fluorine to a dioxine to an alcohol to a methoxy increases the potency um, greater than the efficacy, although the efficacy does increase. Uh, these compounds are beta arrested bias also, but they're less beta arrested bias than the non iodinated NBOM compounds, which really shows us that um, if you put an iodine, you can actually shift the bias to a more neutral bias away from being beta arrested bias, which I think is quite interesting. And, you know, these are the types of things that help us as pharmacologists design drugs to have a mechanism of action that we want. 